Top Med Talk. Welcome to Top Med Talk. This piece comes from our live coverage of Anesthesiology 2022. It is the single largest gathering of anesthesiologists in the world and the annual meeting of the American Society of Anesthesiologists. Now, our live coverage is available now at live.topmedtalk.com. More details in the show notes. Don't forget to subscribe and please help us boost our signal by sharing this podcast wherever and whenever you can. Well, good morning and welcome to Anesthesiology 2022 here in New Orleans, Louisiana. It is day two and Top Med Talk is coming to you from the exhibit hall, booth 2245. I'm Desiree Chapel, your host, and I'm joined by my co-host, Prof- Professor Saul Aronson. Hello, Saul. Good morning, Desiree. Good, good to morning. see you. Day two, Saul, you making it okay? I'm, it's New Orleans. I know, I know. <laughs> you got to pace yourself. You do, you do. We've had amazing conversations from uh, all day mm-hmm. yesterday. If you missed any of those, please do check it out at topmedtalk.com. All the pods will be going up throughout the day today from yesterday as well as today. Now, if you're listening to this on the podcast, know that you can watch the rest of the conversations live streamed from the exhibit hall until Monday tomorrow at one o'clock central. It is at live.topmedtalk.com. That's (laughs) live.topmedtalk.com. That's right. Check out our live stream. Uh, it's going to be great conversations throughout the rest the rest of the weekend. Now, we also have our EBPOM educational hub where you can hear um, and learn more about evidence-based perioperative medicine. That's at live.ebpom.org. I know lots of uh, links there, but that is our hub for all of our educational content and specifically of uh, many conversations that we've had at this meeting as well as meetings um, as well as uh, meetings throughout the country. So, Check that out, uh, and you're going to hear, if you go there, you'll hear more from our next guest. So without further ado, it is with tremendous pleasure um, as a friend and a colleague to introduce uh, Professor Lee Fleischer. It's actually emeritus professor I was just going to say, wait, it is emeritus, isn't it? Pro- professor Emeritus Lee Fleischer. Lee, yes. it's so good to see you. It is a pleasure. Yeah. It is a pleasure. Oh my gosh. Well, Lee, we caught up last year at ASA but you were virtual at this meeting. At that Correct. Meeting. <laughs> and Correct. It, it worked. We were able to have a, a great chat. It, it was. And, and at that point, we were not traveling in the federal government since right. my current role is as chief medical officer and the director of the Center for Clinical Standards and Quality at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. But yeah. I'm here as, uh, as you say, emeritus professor <laughs> of anesthesiology. That's right. I was going to say, let's, let's talk about your current title. Um, Lee, you have been a giant in the world of anesthesia for so many years. Talk to us just briefly for those um, who may not know you. I don't know who that might might be, but both of those people. Yeah, I know for those just, two folks, you're embarrassing talk, me, but that's okay. Uh, you know, I love you. Talk about um, you know your role whenever you were at Penn and some of the the things that you did there because we've had many conversations with you over the years to highlight that. But I really want to make sure people hear some of those things. So 17 years as chair, Mm -hmm. and, you know, one of the things that I think is incredibly important, I know Saul did that when you were at Duke particularly, but it's very important that anesthesiology be very engaged in how the entire health system worked. So besides being the chair of anesthesiology Mm -hmm. and mentoring young people and worrying about the educational and the research programs, and I did a lot of collaborative research, you know, I was chair of the malpractice committee. Mm. I was co-chair of the managed care contracting committee. So I did a lot of the negotiations with Blue Cross Blue Shield and Aetna. And I think those were important. I know you did a lot of negotiations in that role because if we're not at the table. Yeah. You're left behind. Uh, we're left behind. We'll be eating for lunch. On the plate. <laughs> On the plate. That's Absolutely. Because right. okay. most people don't understand how anesthesiology works as far as payment. Unfortunately, true. And they don't understand that we can't be tied to Medicare. That, in fact, it's really important. So being there in the table talking about the other services was critically important. Um, And we really do, both in my current role and at Penn, we really do understand, like, a little bit about everything in medicine. We understand because of our pain clinics, outpatient services, we understand how hospitals work. We have to know a lot of medicine. We know OB. 
Um, I've been involved in the federal government in some OB work. Mm. And when they said, like, why do you fit? And I'm like, well, I was chair of the medical board, but I also was an OB anesthesiologist when I was at Hopkins. So we, we really do understand medicine, surgery, obstetrics, and anesthesia. Yeah, it's a very holistic for sure. Yes. And I would add even population health. I would agree. I would agree. And, and, and yes, I know, you know, uh, I still uh, talk about that paper you wrote with a good colleague, Mark McClellan, and, and it really does show, and, and particularly in my current role, we're talking a lot about social determinants of health. And when Karen Domino yesterday talked about equity, you know, our pre-op clinics and a lot of what we do we can lean into food insecurity, transportation, in our, in what you did at Duke. I mean, it was it was amazing what Monty's been doing. Professor for, Monty Monthan, everyone. <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. <laughs> Sorry to be late, team. For for good. you know, has taught us for decades. So I think it's really interesting as I see both my federal wall and my previous wall, how how we're interacting. Uh, Show floors now open. <laughs> We're live. We are live. <laughs> the, the beauty of live uh, TV and radio. Um, yeah, I mean, there, there's there been so many opportunities to be able to lean in uh, to those spaces. Lee, um, you know, you also just very, very briefly did a lot of work in, um, in, in partnering with multidisciplinary specialties, you know, when it comes to uh, society and societal and anthropology, anthropological type things. Just really briefly kind of go through some of those because I, I find that so fascinating. Well, you know, before I came into the government, um, during the early time of the pandemic, how to address the emotional contagion mm -hmm. of what our intensivists felt of going into the ICU and how if we didn't, like, break that cycle, we wouldn't be able to do our job. There was no vaccine. Yeah. Um, so I actually work with an organizational psychologist to yes. help me understand the anxiety and how to, what are the factors to be able as a chair to say, you know, it's okay and not let the negative emotional contagion uh, I hired a linguistic anthropologist, That's and it, yeah. we had done a lot of work in a couple things. One is in informed consent, you know, um, and we've talked about this before. Patients, we all talk about shared decision making, mm -hmm. but a lot of patients don't have that educational knowledge. You and I can do shared decision making, but a lot of them say, "Hey, doc, what would you do?" Escalating yeah. authority. Absolutely, yes. Well said, and and. You know, that's okay. We just need to understand how to do it best and how a lot of the decisions that we think the surgeon has has really started way upstream. And that's right. what our anthropologist said really, really starts in talking to your neighbors and going to the medical clinic. So by the time you get to the surgeon, there's already sort of an anchoring on what they're going to do. Mm -hmm. Lee, Lee the, the work you did, which I've seen presented a couple of times now, that you just referred to with regards to COVID stressors, mm -hmm. is, is there a plan or have you repeated that? Because we're kind of assuming that a lot of those stressors might have gone away or maybe they've changed and got worse in some things. You know, um, I, I was going to say the same thing. <laughs> I haven't done that work because I'm mainly doing health services You've been work. Busy. So <laughs> I've been busy. <laughs> True. I don't know why, Lee. But... It's been very interesting to watch the healthcare system from from my vantage point, and it it was fascinating what happened when nobody, so many people in the U.S. I, I don't know in the U.K., but I believe it's different but similar. Didn't take the vaccine, and what happened was the um, exasperation. Yes, the anger of providers taking care of people who could have been less sick if they just took the vaccine, took over. And we've been spending a lot of time uh, thinking about in this post-pandemic world, we've got burnout for so many reasons. But I think that's one of them, and I'd be curious. I, I, I love, first of all, I, I just wanted to pause for a moment and, and absorb the phrase emotional contagion i love mm. it and i'm not mine yeah, well, I, I, just, um, I just love that 
Um, and, and to your point, Monty and Lee, the, the concept of, of those emotions that came out of the COVID crisis where we as providers were having to take care of patients who kind of elected not to take care of themselves in the way that one would argue was recommended. Um, and, it, and it was fascinating how we harnessed our emotions, including anger. Um, how does that translate to the patient who smokes or the patient mm. who doesn't manage their diet well? Um, it, there are analogies there, aren't there? And, and how do we use those lessons from COVID going forward? It, it, it's very interesting because we have to acknowledge that we're in privileged positions and we believe in the science. But there's a lot of people, and, and we can't forget about Tuskegee and the distrust of the system. And you got leaders in American medicine and, and getting up there and saying, this is the solution to COVID. And then there's all these examples of how they were wrong. And, just, and it's anecdotal examples. And what we learned is those anecdotes totally discounted because we as scientists don't know how to... In our minds, we talk about the idea. We know all the caveats and all the limitations mm. from our papers, but we don't speak that way. Mm -hmm. We also, um, and this I learned from others, we say they were wrong mm. as opposed to they made a good decision for themselves at the beginning, but can we provide them with more information? And I've learned this from the organizational psychologists who who taught me emotional contagion. So we really have to understand that there's a lot of, what I'm learning, social determinants that have caused a lot of these problems. And the way we articulate it is not helping the problem. It's a really, really good lesson for those of us who are so immersed in the scientific process of a means of communication. But there's a... There's a medical anthropology that I think we are a bit remiss in teaching ourselves as we evolve up our, you know, educational journey. Uh, it, it was fascinating. I've had communication specialists come in. I just had someone who, uh, from the UK, um, Stephen Rolnick, who mm -hmm. does uh, motivational interviewing. He's from Cardiff, mm -hmm. who is, keeps teaching me different ways of thinking. He actually said you should say... You know, you're a smoker. This was more about COVID. Can I do? Can I have permission to talk to you about that, and not just start talking at oh them? Oh my gosh! Right, right, right. And I'm like, that is oh. a game changer. No, but it's a it's a really great point that yeah. I think we don't think about as well as we need to. Yeah. Well, and I mean, we've always been so prescriptive in, in the way we've said things, and and that's the authority of like, well, I'm just going to tell you, and you're going to listen rather than bringing them more into the conversation. I, Leah, we could talk for days about can this. Can I tell one yes, more please story? Do. Yeah, yeah. Boychik, you can do whatever you yeah, want. So, <laughs> come on. Th this was, this was game-changing for me because, in fact, people talk about translation. Mm. Yeah. And we have a very large, in the U.S., Hispanic population. And they talk about, well, you could just get your iPad out and you can translate. And I kept hearing from the Secretary of Health, I got to figure out how to do culture and language appropriate services. Mm. I'm saying, well, we got translators. Well, not the same. And he told, he mm. goes, my father, born in the U.S., mm. only spoke Spanish, very mm. poor English. And when he went to the doctor, he wouldn't tell about his diseases. So even if you sort of spoke Spanish or used a translator, you didn't get to what he needed to do to understand the cultural background of how he talks to doctors. And I finally said, you know, that that was the game changer Light to bulb. me. Yeah, um, ding, ding, ding. I, I can't do that for him, right. yeah. nor will I ever do that for him. I got to find a provider who can. Yeah. Wow, that is... Honestly, that is a light bulb moment. The to, culture to, of medicine. Yeah, it is. The, it is. Wow. And then that's a whole nother group that ha bring a whole nother skill set, you know, into our space, which is I, always wonderful too. Well, Lee, um, we don't have a ton of time. There are a couple more things I wanted to talk to you about. One is um, maternal mortality and, and the care of uh, maternal 
of uh, pregnant patients. people. Yes, pregnant people. <laughs> Been there before, done that. Um, what's changing? So, what needs to change? Um, you know, we know now that there's such structural racism that my administrator, Princeton grad, said even she, who's highly educated, huge job, is that people like her have higher mortality and morbidity when they go through labor and delivery. You probably heard IVF. There's yeah. That there is structural racism in the way we treat um, black women, people of color in this country for maternal mortality. And I finally said, and so when you were at Duke, and, and I never asked anybody to look based upon race, the instance of epidurals, pain management, time to c-section you know we said oh we treated everyone the same but do we know it i cannot answer that with data i only can answer that with my presumptions and assumptions and and we should start doing that as anesthesiologists we can lean in and then of course you know after dodds one dodds the, tell it for people may not for, so the supreme court decision in the u.s in which they reversed Ro- Roe v. Wade. And, and I can't go into a lot of detail, but you know, one of the things that I'm hearing in many states is that providers, and these are obstetricians, are afraid to take people to the OR when they're not truly dying because it's to protect the life of the mother. But I know you're an OB, uh, cardiac anesthesiologist, but back when you were a resident, <laughs> There's, Wait a minute. Let me. Okay. Yep. I got it. <laughs> you got it. It, it. Could you say that a 20 weeker who came in with premature rupture of the membranes, in which you're the anesthesiologist in the OR, do you know when you actually hit that point that where they have a fever? Do they have to be septic? Or if they're quite sick, they're never going to make it to do that DNC. Will re, which would result in a termination of the pregnancy, because right now it's viable. So it, it's, it's heady stuff, and it's um, on so many levels, let's just say, upsetting to even have to have these conversations. Yes. Um, but, but if I could pull back, and Desiree, cut me off if we're running out of time. Yeah. The, the, the question of maternal morbidity, mortality, predates Dodds. Yes. And, and I've always presumed, and, and help me if I'm incorrect here, that it was just a question of access, the, the equality of access. But it's deeper than that. It's deeper than that. Okay. It's deeper that, that it doesn't matter if you're educated and have access. They're still seeing these differences. Mm-hmm. And now, post-Dodds, the question as we as anesthesia providers mm-hmm. who participate in these DNCs, who all of us believe it is the right thing to do, and per the Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act, if a woman comes in, a pregnant person comes in, and they need to be evaluated and stabilized, there's confusion about what that is these days. And I think we as anesthesia providers need to stand up and say that we will support our obstetrical colleagues in doing the right thing for these pregnant individuals. Yeah. Lee, I want to follow up um, on that. Maybe we can uh, set up a call in the the near future to talk more, because I think it is really important and we need to start a conversation around it. And the inequality is quite stark, isn't it? I mean, it's it's shocking to a certain extent. We've done a few interviews before with colleagues in the US in OB practices, and when we listen to the numbers, they're shocking. It's shocking. If you're in Pennsylvania... Mm. No problem. Yeah. If you're in other states, I mean, to if before Dodds we should have practiced one way, post Dodds we need to practice the same way. But I'm not convinced that's happening. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, all right, in the, our last two minutes, that we <laughs> no, we're not going to broach the topic. But Lee, I do. Vote. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, but we're uh, um, just really quickly. So uh, we talk. We have in, in past conversations talked a lot about the merit-based incentive programs and how that drives quality and where we're going 
uh, mm-hmm. in the future. Just briefly, what should we expect in the world of anesthesia for what's coming down the pike and, and kind of looking over the horizon a little bit? Because currently what we're doing, I don't think it's exactly where we need to be. It doesn't sound like. Well, at least the anesthesia, not at least, anesthesia took a lead in developing the MIPS value pathways, mm-hmm. which is a, even if you're part of a large practice plan, which you and I were, we're not being measured on flu shots, but we're measured on anesthesia work. And and that, I think, is a, I give the ASA a lot of credit for taking a lead and working on that. And the goal is really to get to more outcomes that matter mm-hmm. and more shared outcomes. Um, because, Saul, you were foreshadowed. It's all about population health. It's all about accountable care. Well, anesthesia can um, take a role in flu shot uh, compliance. You know, when the patients are going down that swim lane of surgery, why shouldn't we be obliged to check their flu status? Yeah. Well, both of you taught us that and and all the work you did at UCL. So... The big challenge we have at the moment, Lee, I think we're all feeling is we know, we think we know the right thing to do and we've demonstrated the right thing to do. Now we have a challenge where we don't have enough providers to just do the anesthesia. Mm. Yes. And I'm saying the just. Anesthesia is really, really important, but they're sort of mm. pushing back and say, you know, it's regressing uh, possibly. Yeah. In, in our, we're committed to the public health components of it. We've got to follow through and get the providers, which are going to be a much more diverse group, to be able to deliver the dream that's been described. All right. Well, gentlemen, Lee, I hate to cut us off. To be continued. Because we can. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We have got. Always a pleasure. It is always a pleasure, and I'm so so glad we can make it work uh, this this morning. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much. We will be checking back in soon. I think. I think we need to have some good conversation. Thank you so much for listening to Top Med Talk. You know, you can find all the content that we've recorded over uh, yesterday and throughout the rest of the meeting at topmedtalk.com. Um, the live stream, be sure to share with your friends, live.topmedtalk.com. Have a great day. See you right back. <laughs>